Welcome to the Certitude of the Catholic Faith. I'm John Veneri, and today we're just going to pick up where we left off with the last program. If you remember the last program, we ended by asking the question, if God were to speak to mankind, how would we know it? How would we know it? And I'm going to open with a story that um, something uh, that happened to me. I was living in Niagara Falls for a little bit, and one night, one snowy night, there was a knock at the door, the place I was staying. And I opened the door, and there were two well-dressed young men looking at me. And um, they said, hello. And I said, hello. And they said, do you live here? And I said, yes, I live here. And they said, how long have you lived here? And I said, you're rather nosy. I don't even know you. And they said, well, we are members of the Church of Jesus Christ of the Latter-day Saints. And I said, oh, you're Mormons. They said, yes, you've heard of us. I said, oh yes, I know about you and the Jehovah Witnesses and the Seventh-day Adventists and all those religions that are about 100 years old. So with that, we started into a very heavy discussion on religion, on the topic of religion, on the topic of revelation. And at one point, of course, it got rather heated. It was friendly enough, but it does get rather heated. And at one point, the Mormon raised up his hand like the Statue of Liberty and said, Joseph Smith, that's the founder of the Mormons, Joseph Smith is the only human being whom God has spoken to. And I said, well, if you think that, then let's take a bus to New York City, and we'll go down into the subway, and I'll introduce you to 17 people who claim that God is speaking to them. The point is, is, going to, is, God, is, going, is he going to leave us to the mercy of someone who just comes along and says, I'm a messenger from God. I was sent from God. Listen to me, and listen to me because I say so. No, he respects our intellect. He gave us intellect, and he is going to give us reasons to believe. Everything we believe, there's going to be, everything we know to be true regarding the faith, there's going to be a reason for it. Um, it reminds me of another story. Of, uh, those in the audience here know that I used to play in nightclubs when I was young. I used to play in nightclubs, um, pop music. I, don't, I haven't done it for decades. I don't do it anymore. But at one point, um, I was, we were playing, and I met a, I happened to be talking to a dancer. She was a professional dancer. She was uh, what we call in the United States a, real, a bit of an airhead. Uh, but I was talking with her, and I was, as I was talking with her, my scapular fell out of my shirt, fell out of the, of the button of my, it, the, of my shirt here. And so she was sitting down, I was standing up, and she picked it up, and she looked at it, and she said, Oh, well, you're part of the Jesus movement? And I said, uh, well, you, you might say that. Um, I'm Roman Catholic. And she said, uh, I, I, don't I don't believe in any of that. I said, what do you believe in? She said, oh, I believe in clouds and the sky and, and daisies and kittens. Um, she believed in this, whether she did or not, I don't know, but she, she believed in it because it sounded nice. It made her feel good, but it had no basis in reality. Something a little more serious, there is a, a so-called Catholic theologian who is neither Catholic nor theologian, but she has the title of Catholic theologian, and her name is Rosemary Reuther. She preaches a gospel of feminism, and she talks about uh, the fact that uh, when she was younger, she was talking to a nun, and she said, I could hardly tell this nun, this sister, that my devotion to Mary was far, something much less than my, de my devotion to some far more powerful females that I knew, Isis, Athena, and Artemis. Now, those are three pagan gods. These are creatures who don't exist. They do not exist, and Rosemary Ruther is saying, my devotion to her, to these three gods, is greater than my devotion to Mary, who did exist. No, what we see there is belief just becomes a matter of the will. This is what I want to believe, so this is what I will believe. It has no foundation in reality. The dancer, Rosemary Ruther, they believe these things because they want to believe them. But God is not going to, the point of what I'm going to be getting at in this program, is that God is not going to abandon us to this sort of shallow sentiment. 
God is the author of reason. He is the source of reason. He created what, us with an intellect, with the ability to reason. And the fact that we have an intellect is the defining mark that makes us human. So he's going to deal with us in a manner that conforms to our reason. He's not going to insult our reason. I think it was Aristotle, it was one of the great philosophers, who said, whatever is received is received in the manner of the recipient. So whatever is received is received in the manner of the recipient. So we know that when we teach children, we teach them differently from the way we teach adults. When we're trying to train a dog, we teach them differently. We train them differently even from the way we train a child. It doesn't do any good for us to sit down with a dog who's chewing our slipper and say, you know, Fido, the final end of that slipper is to be worn on my feet. And by chewing it, you are, you are taking it away from its final end and you're destroying it in the process. So I would prefer that you don't do that anymore. And the dog will just look at you and keep chewing. Whatever is received is received in the manner of the recipient. And because we have intellect, because we have reason, God is going to deal with us in everything that conforms to our reason and that satisfies our reason. That's the main point. It satisfies our reason. Now, we all know that history is full of men who claim to come from God. They say, I am from God, or sometimes I am God, or come follow me. Now, at this point of our discussion, every one of those people who say, I am from God, I have a message from God, follow me, at this point, every one of them has a right to be heard. And this is the, this is the manner, this is the structure that Bishop Sheen teaches by. So, everyone has a right to be heard, so let's take a look at them. You line them all up. Buddha, Confucius, Mohammed, Socrates, Jesus Christ, Martin Luther, L. Ron Hubbard, Joseph Smith, the founder of the Mormons, who we talked about earlier, Maharishi, the one who imported transcendental meditation to the West, Immanuel Kant, Shirley MacLaine, all of them. Line them all up. Line all of them, any of the latest founders who have started a religion from New York to Paris to Fiji to India. Line them all up. Now, reason dictates that there are three tests which any honest person could, can employ in order to see, well, which one of them is a messenger from God? Are any of them messengers from God? And these are the three tests that we have. Number one, whoever comes should be pre-announced. Now, we know that car companies do this all the time. The Ford, the Fiat, when their new line is coming out, they start advertising even before we see them on the street. Here is what's coming. Look for it. Uh, we usually, if we're polite, we tell our friends that we're coming over ahead of time. I'm coming. I'm coming over, and I'll be here at this date. Uh, brides and grooms, when they're getting married, do the same thing. They send out wedding invitations. They send out invitations. We're going to get married at this date. So, pre-announced. Whoever comes should be pre-announced. And secondly, whoever comes should work authentic signs and wonders in order to substantiate his claims. In some ways, this messenger of God should do only what God, could, only what God can do in order to prove, yes, I am from God. And third, nothing he teaches should be contrary to reason, though it may be above our reason. Nothing he teaches should be contrary to reason, but, should be a, but it might be above our reason. So we go, we're going to look at these, especially the first two. If God is sending someone, reason dictates that he would be pre-announced. And this is reasonable because it prevents anyone from just showing up on the stage of history and saying, I am from God, listen to me. And the extent to which this messenger conforms with the announcements, you could judge the validity of his claims. For example, if a man came to Rome and he just showed up at the Italian parliament and said, I'm a Hungarian diplomat, let me in. Well, the Italian government would say two things. They said, number one, did you tell us we were, you were coming? Did your authority, did your country tell us that you were coming? And secondly, show us your passport, show us your credentials. This is how the mind works. This is how man does things. And God deals with us in the same way. So we ask all of these, all of these religious leaders, Buddha, 
Was it predicted the city in which you would be born? Confucius, was it predicted where you would live? Socrates, did anyone foretell that you would die drinking hemlock juice? Mohammed, was it predicted that you would be born of a certain race of people? <clears throat> and another thing, did any one of your mothers know you were coming? Were you named ahead of time? Was there any detailed account of where you would live, where you would die, the type of teaching you would teach, the type of enemies you would provoke? Is there any prediction that when you die, not one of your bones would be broken? Christ, Jesus Christ, is the only one who can say yes. I was pre-announced. There is a detailed account of what to look for in the messenger of God who is to come. He was pre-announced because if you remember too, when you read the Gospels, when Christ came on the stage of history, he didn't just pop up and say, listen to me. He pointed backwards to that record of prophecy and said, you've heard of me before. How, many often, how often in times did our Lord say so that the scriptures be fulfilled? And also, the people to whom our Lord addressed himself, when he came, they weren't saying, who is this man? Who is this new phenomenon? They were saying to each other, is he the one we've been waiting for? Is he the one to come? Now, we could give about 15 programs just on listing the prophecies that were given in the Old Testament about our Lord and how our Lord fulfilled them to the letter. I mean, we're not going to do it at all in this program. I'm just going to list a few a few of them. First, the prediction that Christ would be born in Bethlehem. Micaiah 5.2. I think some of you know the quote, And thou, Bethlehem Ephrata, art a little one among the thousands of Judah. Out of thee shall come forth unto me, that is to be the ruler in Israel. And his going forth is from beginning, from the days of eternity. So, we, we have that prediction, and we know that our Lord was born in Bethlehem. And we also know that Mary and Joseph did not manipulate things so they could get themselves to, to Bethlehem in time for the birth. No, Caesar Augustus in Rome made the pronouncement that the census had to be made, and Mary and Joseph were forced to go to Bethlehem. They were forced to go. God used an act of a pagan leader, Caesar Augustus, to shift the entire populations of the world so that that prophecy would be fulfilled, that the Savior would be born in Bethlehem. Second, the slaughter of the innocents. The slaughter of the innocents was predicted in the Old Testament, Jeremiah 31, 15. Thus saith the Lord, a voice was heard on high of lamentation, of mourning and weeping, Rachel weeping for her children and refusing to be comforted for them because they are no more. These type of details are predicted and fulfilled. That Jesus would enter Jerusalem riding a donkey. That type of detail was predicted. Zechariah 9. Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout for joy, O daughter of Jerusalem. Behold thy king will come to thee, the just and savior. He is poor and riding upon a donkey, upon a coat, the fowl of a donkey. That Jesus, the other prediction, another prediction, that Jesus would be rejected by Jewish leadership of the time. Psalm 119, the stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. Again, a pre prediction. That Christ would be betrayed by a close friend. Again, predicted in the Psalms. For even the man of peace in whom I trusted, who ate my bread, hath greatly supplanted me. In other words, has betrayed me. And the prediction that I mentioned earlier, that none of his bones would be broken. Psalm 34, 20, the Lord keepeth all their bones, not one of them shall be broken. We know that during the crucifixion, that when the, between the two thieves, which was also predicted that he would die amongst the reprobate, but between the two thieves, they broke the legs of the two thieves in order to hasten the death. But when they went to our Lord, they saw he was already dead, so they jammed a, a, a spear up his side and that pierced his heart. So that prediction is fulfilled. None of his bones are broken. That they would cast lots for our Lord's garments. Psalm 21, 18, 19. They have numbered all my bones and they have looked and stared upon me. They parted my garments among them and upon my vesture they cast lots. 
a prediction fulfilled at the time of the crucifixion. And the last one that we'll deal with is that our Lord's death would atone for the sins of mankind. This is from Isaiah. It's very interesting to read Isaiah because Isaiah has been sometimes called the fifth gospel. There is so much detail about our Lord's life in Isaiah that you would be tempted to think that it was written after the time of our Lord, just so you could connect the dots to our Lord. But it wasn't. It was written before, because we have the Jews of today, of course, who tell us that this is the, the Isaiah of, of all times. But Isaiah says, but he was wounded for our iniquities. He was bruised for our sins. The chastisements of our peace was upon him, and by his bruises we are healed. He was offered because it was his own will. We know that in the scripture. He gave himself up to the Romans. And he opened not his mouth. He shall be led as a sheep to the slaughter and shall be dumb as a lamb before his shearer. And he, did not, and he shall not open his mouth. That type of detail. There was one clergyman, I guess he was pretty, uh, pretty good at math. And uh, he worked out the odds of all this. And he said the odds of an individual, there are so many prophecies, hundreds of prophecies, not only about Christ, but about the institution he would found, but I'm getting ahead of myself. There are so many prophecies about our Lord in the Old Testament that were fulfilled in Christ that the odds of it doing, uh, the odds of it happening is if you get a 1, you put it over a 64, and after that 64, you add 128 zeros. That is the odds of someone fulfilling those prophecies by chance. So that, so Christ is the only one who was pre-announced. So we say to all those other religious leaders, well, you might be interesting, certain things you say, you might be on the road to truth in certain areas, but you're not the one we're interested in. You were not pre-announced. And Christ is the one who captures our attention. So, that's the first one. Whoever comes should be pre-announced. Christ is the only religious leader that fulfills that. Second, whoever comes should work miracles, should do things that only God can do in order to prove he is who he said he was. And Christ was the one who worked miracles to prove precisely that. He did things only God can do. Now, we see this in the Old Testament. When Moses went to Mount Sinai, and he was, and our Lord was speaking, the Lord God was speaking to him, and he was confused of, you know, exactly what is this? Is this really the, the God of Israel speaking? And in order to prove that, our Lord worked a miracle for Moses. He said to Moses, put your arm in your cloak. So he put his arm in his cloak, pull it out. When he pulled it out, it was covered with leprosy. Lord God said, put the arm in the cloak. He did it again, pull it out, and his arm was as fresh as baby skin. See, this was a miracle to authenticate that it was God who was speaking. Now, our Lord did, this, did similar things. He performed miracles. But it's very interesting. He didn't do it as a magician. He didn't pull rabbits out of hats. He didn't saw people in half, saw ladies in half. He didn't, you know, produce parrots in cages from under, from under a, a sheet. No. What did he do? He went about doing good. He healed the sick. He restored sight to the blind. He raised people from the dead. He healed their infirmities. He fed the hungry. He gave hearing to the deaf. He even helped fishermen catch fish. They were having a bad time fishing. He said, go back out, and there was a miraculous catch of fish. There was a mother crying because her son had died. They were carrying the son out in the funeral procession. He saw the mother crying. He had compassion. He walked over. The mother didn't even ask him to do it. And he raised the son to dead, moved by compassion. So that's the second criteria. He worked miracles. We also look at the uniqueness of Christ. The uniqueness of Christ. There are, there are people who try to say, well, he didn't really live. Well, of course, he did live. We have uh, Josephus Flavius, who is the Jewish historian, who talks very matter-of-factly about this Nazarene who lived. Uh, the Roman historian Tacitus, he was commenting on Nero's persecution of Christians as, and he was doing it uh, as a scapegoat for, the, for burning Rome. But here's what Tacitus says. He says, the author of that name, Christ, was executed during the reign of Tiberius during Pontius Pilate. Co completely unique, okay? 
only religious leader to be pre-announced, only religious leader to work signs and wonders, only religious leader to rise from the dead, and he taught like no one else. This is another very interesting thing about our Lord. He taught like no one else. Confucius, Buddha, even Aristotle, whom I love, they say, I love Aristotle, not the other ones, but anyway, but they all say, obey these laws, follow these principles, follow these precepts. Our Lord said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Learn of me, for I am meek and humble in heart. All goodness, all truth was personified in him, and he's the one to whom we look for to imitate and for, and for light. No other religious leader, talking about the uniqueness of our Lord, no other religious leader, religious leader brings their followers, in, followers into such an intimate and personal relationship with him. No other religious leader pr proclaims such a high moral code. There are things that our Lord talked about that the apostles would say, well, that's impossible. But our Lord, it's impossible to live this way. But our Lord talked it anyway. He spoke it anyway. He also spoke with authority. You have heard it said of old, such and such, but I tell you, and then he gives the correction. He spoke with authority, and he is unique because he proclaimed himself to be Lord. He says, not everyone who said to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven. Another thing that is absolutely unique about Jesus Christ is that he split time in two. He split time in two. Even the atheists today date things B.C. and A.D., before Christ and Anno Domino, before Christ and the year of our Lord. And another thing that is unique about our Lord Jesus Christ is even his antithesis is predicted. We all know about it. There is the prediction of an antichrist who is to be a man who will be the summation of all evil, the man of sin. The Antichrist is predicted in Scripture. We see it in Daniel. We see it in the Apocalypse. And there's details about him, too. We know what to look for. Movies are made about the Antichrist, the Omen, and things like that. There is no prediction, you'll notice, of an anti-Buddha. There is no prediction of an anti-Muhammad. There is no prediction of an anti-Confucius, an anti-Shirley MacLaine, an anti-L. Ron Hubbard. Only the prediction of an Antichrist. So, to sum this up, Christ was the only religious leader to be pre-announced, and he was the one who worked miracles to prove that he was God. He even said, if you don't believe my words, at least believe my works. Now, the question is, now that we've established our Lord as the only religious leader worth listening to, the question is, how does he communicate himself to us today? Did he tell his apostles, look, just write books, and hand them out to people, and then people will read it and figure it out for themselves? Or did he establish some sort of society, some sort of organism, some sort of holy household that would carry on his work and to formally teach, govern, sanctify, and offer worship to the Father in his name? That's the big question, and that is the question that we will answer in our next program. Thank you.